Vetan said that he would uh, join too. He he's already here. He's here. He's here already. Hanul oh. is here as well. Oh yes, great. I'm here. Thank you. I'm oh. here. Oh great. A, a bit early for me, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hanu is here too. Uh, Horst is here. Horst Han is here. Very nice. And uh, Hi. good to see you all. Yeah, great. Ami. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. And so you should, Amog, you should take a picture, I mean, a screenshot of all, all the illustrious people. My dear colleague, Sundar Gopal Ghosh is here. Uh, yes, sir, right. Better if you can switch on. My former- oh, uh, if Indirectly, you are asking to turn on the videos. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to, to see all the people, although we are taking one minute or two minutes extra. Sure. Uh, uh, just to see all the people. Rob uh, just today wrote to me that uh, at, people were so excited to be at ACS, removing all the uh, all the masks and uh, speaking to people. Uh, and Hanu, Hanu is here too, uh, you said. And Ananya, are you there? Ananya, my former student, so she's just joining. Are you there? Yes, I'm there, but I can't switch on the camera, sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, using Office PC, so no camera there. Mm. Yeah, it is not too late there. Very, very nice. So uh, Krishna Das is here too, in different parts. Um, do you see our Manfred campus here? No, I don't see him. Oh, Papri, you are here too. Very nice to see you. So shall we get started then? Um, um, okay, Amo, yeah, so, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Start recording, please. Recording in progress. Shall I start? No, please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to one and all present here. I welcome you all to the third lecture of our COE lecture series on molecular materials and functions. Today's speaker is Professor Jianping Shi, a renowned scientist in the field of atomically precise nanoclusters and their applications in medicine and catalysis. Professor Shi uh, completed his BS and MS in chemical engineering from Tsinghua University, China. He then completed his PhD in molecular engineering of biological and chemical systems from Singapore MIT Alliance. He then conducted his postdoctoral research from Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology, Singapore. Professor Xi uh, worked as a visiting scientist at Department of uh, Material Science and Engineering at MIT and later joined NUS Singapore as an assistant professor. He is currently Dean's Chair Associate Professor at Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at NUS, where he has established the Nobel Metal Nanocluster Research Group. Uh, uh, coming to his uh, research interests, uh, uh, he is interested in working on Nobel Metal Nanoclusters, Aggregation Induced Emission Type Luminescent uh, Metal Nanoclusters, Nanomedicine and Nanocatalysis. He has over uh, 200 publications with more than two. 24,300 citations with a H index of 82. He has received many awards like uh, Faculty of Engineering Teaching uh, Commendation List uh, from NUS in uh, 2012, uh, Faculty of Engineering Teaching Honors uh, List uh, from NUS in uh, 2014, Faculty of Engineering Young Researcher Award from NUS in 2016. Uh, he is also a, a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry since 2019. 
He has been awarded highest cited researcher in chemistry consecutively from 2018 to 2021 by uh, Clarivet Analytics. Uh, he is also an associate editor of Aggregate, a journal of Wiley. Today, he will be delivering a lecture on total synthesis of metallic molecules. Let us all give a warm welcome to Professor Jianping Shi. Okay. Th thank you. Megala, Ma Ma I, I can share my screen. Yes, sir. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, well, very good afternoon and very good evening or good morning. So my name is Jian Ping Xie. It's my great honor to be here. So first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Pradeep to bring me here and give me this very great opportunity to share some of our recent studies on metanalo cluster. So I'm extremely excited to be here because I see a lot of seniors and also like a lot of the pioneers in the field of metanalo cluster, like Professor Robert Wetton and Professor Sukuda, Hanu, and of course, Professor Pro Pro uh, Pro Pro Pradeep. So it's my great honor to like, share our recent study on this uh, metallic molecules. Yeah. So in the past 10 years, I got a lot of inspirations from my seniors, like these four professors, and of, of course, a lot of other professors in the field of metanol clusters. So today, I think this is a public lecture. So I would like to like, just give a like, brief introduction on metanol clusters and share some of our stories and especially the, what are the scientific questions so we have identified and what are our methodologies and what are our key findings. So I will leave the, the detailed technical parts away and if the students or the postdocs have the further questions, so you are always welcome to send me the emails and after my lecture. So again, the materials I would like to discuss is one type of the molecular materials. So it's metanol clusters, and the, the orange here is uh, metal actins. So it can be gold, silver, or other metal actins. And the yellow is organic ligands. So my group are interested in the tire ligands. So today my talk will focus on the total synthesis of these materials. Because these materials, they have very interesting like optical properties or like catalysis properties. So they can be used for many applications. But if you want to realize the, the high quality of applications, so we need to have very precise synthetic chemistry that can like control the size, composition, surface, and structure of these materials. And if we want to develop a precise synthetic chemistry, so we may need to have some basic understanding of these the reaction pathways and towards the synthesis of these atomically precise metanol clusters. So today I will just share some of our recent studies on the total synthesis. Actually, the total synthesis is not a new concept. I got the inspirations from the total synthesis of the organic molecules. So we know the total synthesis is a very powerful platform to synthesize organic molecules with various function and properties. And oh. I just give you the one examples. So like, you know, the organic chemistry is very oh. powerful. So you can simply use like four elements, like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, yeah. and to create a universe of the organic, you see like one noise there. You, universe, small molecules like drugs or, or very complicated molecules like the DNA or proteins. So it's functions. But if we check our periodical table and metals are totally different. So the majority of elements are metals and crystalline structure. So they are lacking of this, we call a molecular-like structure diversity. So my simple, 
elements, like common metal elements, like gold and silver, and then to create an unlimited of the, these atomically precise the metallic molecules. And for these molecules, and we know it's similar as other molecules, like organic molecules. So they should have the molecular formula and they should have molecular structure. But more importantly, these properties that we can. So what are the properties we are looking for for this molecule? So for the metal materials, so we are interested in these materials and simply because they have some chemical or even biological properties that we can use. And for the metals, they have this the size dependent properties. And for example, their optical properties are size dependent. So if, if you see the like the uh, buck gold, uh, we can use a gold as an example. So for bulk gold, it's yellow. And when we decrease the size of these gold materials, so it's at the nanoscale size region, so we can start to see the different color of gold. So for example, so we can have like red gold solution, we can have blue gold solution and green gold solutions. So these are from the nanocrystals. So it's aggregations of thousands of gold atoms or even more gold atoms. So they will form this, we call a continuous electronic states. And they show this very interesting surface plasma resonance properties, SPR properties. And as a materials chemist, so we can control the shape, size, and composition, and then to control the properties of these gold nanocrystals. So if you still remember your, for our young students, right, postdocs, you still remember your high school chemistry, so now for a single metal atom, like gold atoms, so it has these discrete electronic states. So the next questions we may ask ourselves is, so what will be the transition between these single gold atoms, discrete electronic states, to these thousands of gold atoms, continuous electronic states? Okay. So the transition is the aggregation of a number of the gold atoms or other metal atoms. So these are the nanoclusters. So I will discuss today. So for the clusters, so the typical size is about one nanometer or even less than one nanometer. So it has this discrete electronic states. And it's different from the larger brother, like the gold nanocrystals. They do not show SPR properties, but they do show some of the molecular-like properties. So this can characterize as a molecular materials, right? And for example, they show a very strong luminescence. So these are our clusters. So under the UV light, so now you can start to see the clusters, they can show strong luminescence. So this is very different from the large gold nanocrystals. So they have a different optical absorption and molecular light absorption and the catalysis properties are also totally different. So if you still remember uh, in the last lecture, the Professor Sukuda had discussed so what are the unique the catalytic properties of the metal clusters? Because in clusters, and most of the actants are on the surface of these clusters if they are not protected by a very strong ligand. So similar as gold nanocrystals, so as a material scientist, we can also control the size, composition, surface, and structure, and then to control the molecular light properties. And then we can use it to for different applications, like catalysis applications or for the biomedical applications. <clears throat> so for the properties, so we one very interesting is a fluorescence properties. So this is very unique for the ultra small like metal nanoclusters. It cannot be seen in like metal nanocrystals at a size above three nanometer. So it's, is uh, like the molecular properties on so our cluster is similar as a molecules or semiconductors. So it can show a very strong luminescence because this metal nano cluster, they may have very unique interaction with our light. <coughs> so we can control like the core of the cluster, right? uh, yellow is a uh, gold, for example, and also 
the protecting ligand or motif and to control their interaction with light and lens, they can have some very unique the optical properties. And we can use their optical properties. For example, they have luminescence properties and for the bioimaging applications or biosensing applications or for other applications related to the optical properties. Or we can also use like a cluster. So now they have the optical properties and they also can serve as a catalyst. So they are very good catalytic properties. So we can combine these two properties together and cluster may also serve as photocatalysis. So it can be used for photocatalysis, for the design of photocatalysis for the different applications. Okay. So I will just use and one more slide to give a very brief introduction for the properties of the metanol cluster as I will not discuss the details of the properties in this lecture. So for the metanol cluster, the luminescence properties and can be contributed from the core of the cluster or the ligand, the surface of the clusters. So we, we found out, so for the metanol cluster, so that luminescence and have the properties, we call it aggregation induced emissions. So we call it AIE type of luminescence metanol clusters. So AIE is not a new concept. It has been developed by the Professor Ben Zhong Tang from Hong Kong for the organic molecules. So it's in organic molecules fuel, so you can use the AIE, we aggregate the molecules to enhance the luminescence of these uh, organic molecules. So we found out for the clusters or the goal with the tightly complexes, they also have these type of properties. So I will just use this a very simple like, video to demonstrate like, for this aggregation induced emissions. So the meaning is if you aggregate the molecules, they will show luminescence like this, right? So this is, an, is a solid form. So it's an extreme of ag aggregations. So if you dissociate, this uh, solid form, it will dissociate in, in solution, like in water, and then their luminescence will disappear. So we're shown in here. So it's solid form under UV light, you see these orange emissions. So if you spray the water, and then they will dissociate in water, and then the luminescence disappear. So we spray the external, so this external can induce the aggregation of this go one tighter complexes, luminescence come back. So you spray the water again, the luminescence will disappear. So if you use the water ethanol and aggregate, luminescence come back. So it shows uh, this, we call the reversible properties for this AIE. And we can also control the AIE properties of metanol cluster through the different level of the aggregations. So for example, at a single cluster level. So we can control a go one, a metal uh, tire leg complexes on the surface of cluster and then to control their luminescence. Or it can be the cluster in cluster. So we can also aggregate the cluster and then to further enhance their luminescence. And we can also control like the length of the, the metal tire leg complexes on the surface of cluster and that can affect like the luminescence properties. Like the emissions can be from yellow, orange, red, and all the way to the near infrared red, uh, NRR properties. So, so this is the properties we are very interested in, the luminescence properties. So for today's talk, I will focus on the metallic molecules or is one type of the molecular materials. And we have not discussed the applications of these materials. And for my group, we are interested in to use this uh, water soluble metanol cluster for some biomedical applications, like bioimaging applications or the antibacterial properties and all at least uh, 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 using it as the cancer radio therapy. And so today I will not discuss this. So I will we'll focus my discussions on some fundamental issues related to the cluster chemistry. So we are particularly interested in uh, two topics. So the first one is for the uh, material synthesis. So we know if you want to realize a very consistent applications 
right? Of all of this. So we need a very like efficient synthetic methodology. Or uh, we also need to have a large scale synthesis of our materials with very high quality. So the meaning of the high quality is we can precisely control the size composition, surface, and structure of metanol cluster at the atomic level. And cause this is atomically precise metanol clusters. So we are trying to develop the precise synthetic chemistry and try to understand this precise synthetic chemistry and then to realize atomic level control. So the second topic we are interested in is the fundamental properties. Cause we know for the applications of the clusters, so we are always look at the functions of these functional materials, right? And this is metanol clusters, the properties, the physical, chemical, or biological properties. And we are particularly interested in the fluorescence properties of metanol clusters. So we would like to provide the molecular level understanding of these fluorescence properties. Okay. So today my, my discuss uh, focus will be the first one. So this will be the material synthesis. So as I mentioned, because this is a public lecture, so I would like to skip the very detailed the technical part. So I will just focus on, so what are our thoughts in this particular field? So for example, what are the scientific questions we identify? So what are our methodology? So what are our key findings using this particular methodology? So this is for the material synthesis. If you are working on like a particular like, inorganic nanochemistry or the synthesis of inorganic nanomaterials, so I think these scientific questions will always puzzle us. So for example, if we want to synthesize this like AU25 with 18 tile ligand the nanocluster, so this is the most popular cluster in the cluster community. So we have the 25 gold actins, a like yellow, and a brown is sulfur actins, right? Or it can be linked to the tile ligands. So we can design a different synthetic methodology to synthesize this gold nanocluster. So for example, you can have like gold, I, gold acids and adding the protecting ligands. So in our case, we always use water. So the solvent are using is water. So we adding the reducing agents. So it can be different reducing agent like sodium borohydride, or you can use like CO, the milder reducing agent. So a different type of reducing agent. Agent. We start to see the color change in our reactor. So from yellow to orange to a uh, reddish brown, and finally it will de deepen right for this color. So after several minutes, sometimes or after one hour or two hours. You open this reactor and then you can have our final product. And if you have very good precise synthetic chemistry, so we can synthesize a high quality of these products. Okay. But the problems we may ask is, so what exactly happening inside this reactor, right? You see the different color changes inside this reactor, but what happens inside this reactor? So it's more like a black box, right? So we know the inputs, of our reactor. So we know the, let this are input, right? So we know the outputs of our reactor. So this is our final products, but we don't know what happens inside this reactor. Right? So these are always the open questions related to the precise synthetic chemistry, especially for this inorganic nanochemistry or inorganic nanomaterial synthesis. So this is always a black box. So we have very strong interest, try to give a little bit understanding of this black box. So for example, so we would like to know, so what are the key intermediates towards our inputs and to our outputs, right? So what can we identify all of them, these intermediates towards the formation of our final products? So if you can identify the intermediates, so we know the reaction kinetics, reaction dynamics, and then we can write down the step-by-step -step reactions and towards the synthetic rules of this final product. So this is similar as our total synthesis of organic molecules. Right? So we can design the different steps 
and finally to achieve the synthesis of our final products, right? Okay. So if you can have a good understanding of intermediates and also the reaction involved in our synthesis, so we may achieve the next level. We can precisely control composition and structure at the atomic level, but more importantly, is at a predictable manner. So this is extremely challenging in, uh, in organic nanochemistry. So now if every time if you have a recipe and then you cook your material, uh, your, 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 your precursors, and finally you can have your products and then you explain, right? Uh, how to synthesize this product. But before you cook your, like your reactor, you run your reactor. So you, you don't know what exactly you can get, right? Okay. So can we re achieve a little bit, we call a predictable manner for the synthesis of the methanol clusters. And if you have this information, we may achieve a little bit and not like fully realize this total synthesis of methanol cluster, right? Okay. So these are uh, very open questions, not simply for the methanol cluster synthesis, but I think it's also for many other inorganic nanomaterials synthesis or inorganic nanochemistry. So actually we got the inspiration again is for the total synthesis of the organic molecules. So you know it's total synthesis is a very great platform to synthesize a very complicated organic molecules. So I just give you one example here, like the quinine. So it's a very important drug. It's a complicated molecules. So we can use these two precursors and you can design more than 20 steps and to precisely synthesize these molecules. And more importantly, during the synthesis of these molecules, we know exactly all the intermediates, right? And steps, or these 20 steps towards the synthesis of these organic molecules. So this is the beauty of the total synthesis. So can we achieve similar level of control in, like, in organic nanochemistry? And let this always our dream. So we, we would like to spend all our efforts, try to understand the direction, the processes, and to whether we can match a little bit to this total synthesis and in the level of the organic molecules. So you check this, the key challenges here in the like, nanocluster synthesis is to identify the intermediates and in our reactor towards the formation of our final products. Right? So if we can identify our intermediates, so we can understand reaction dynamics, we can understand the reaction kinetics, and then we can provide more useful information for the synthesis. So inspired by a lot of our, my, my seniors and my pioneers in a field of the methanol cluster. So we seen the, real time, the max spectrometry. So that have been already used in uh, very regularly in uh, organic molecule synthesis. So let me give us some useful information and to identify the key intermediates towards the formation of the final products. And we can then provide some understanding of this reaction kinetics, dynamics, and now it's at a molecule level or atomic level, right? And if it's this information, we may also propose some of the reaction pathways for our intermediates and also our final products. So we've seen this the real-time mass spectrometry or ESMS could be a very powerful platform for our understanding. So actually the platform is very simple. So it can be shown in this video. So it's more like you are watching the formation of the final products and through the understanding of the molecular formula, right? The changes in molecular formula by using a max spectrometry, okay? And then you can analyze it and then you can give you some useful information. So I can show you in this uh, AU25, uh, go nanocluster synthesis. So we can have this, the time evolution, you can monitor the synthesis process. And for example, so at the beginning, you have the precursors. So each of these P are related to a certain molecular formula. So if you run your reactor or initiate a reduction, so we start to see some of the peak disappear and some of the peak appear. So these peak are related to a certain molecular formula, right? 
and the peak related to the products are continue increase. And if you analyze this max spectrum, and we can start to understand some of the reaction chemistry at the atomic level. So for example, we can identify the intermediates towards the synthesis of these particular products, the AU25, SR18. And we can also know the time evolution abundance of all these intermediates. And from this time evolution abundance, we can then propose the reactions towards the synthesis of the final products. So we can also identify some of the reactions here. So this like reduction reaction, addition reaction, or metathesis reactions, and that involve in the synthesis of these particular products. So we see in the, the max spectrometry is a very powerful platform that can help us to understand the reaction dynamics and reaction kinetics, of course. Okay. So they can give us some of the atomic level understanding. So this slides summarize what we have done in the past 10 years along these research directions. So it's by using like the max spectrometry and tandem mass, and also combined with some of these the optical properties like the UV based absorption spectrometry, and to try to understand the reaction processes during the synthesis of the metal nano clusters. So we have contributed one account that's about four years ago to demonstrate the the proof of concept of this, the total synthesis of metallic molecules and in a few of the precise synthetic chemistry. So of course, I, all this will have been done by six of and many others of my fantastic PhD students. So they are full of like curiosity. It's like detective, right? So they're trying to understand what exactly happening. So inside the reactor and during the synthesis or during the conversion of these clusters. Okay. So I will just uh, uh, present some of the, the, the summary here and to, to identify the scientific questions we ask ourselves. And I will not discuss the details in each of these studies. So we are seeing interest to synthesize this uh, most popular metal cluster, like AU25 with 18 the tile ligands. And it can be synthesized by a very simple method like through the reduction. So we have gold acid, tile ligand, water, and you're adding the reducing agents. Okay. And then through some time, you can synthesize these particular products. But the questions we may ask is, so what exactly is happening? So when you're adding the reducing agents, so how will this reducing agent reduce your metal ions to form the metal atoms? So how will metal atoms aggregate to form a small clusters. So how can these small cluster to further grow to form the big clusters, right? So why the final product is AU25, but not AU24 or AU26, right? So we are trying to understand, we call this the reduction growth in a different reducing agent by using, for example, CO or by using a sodium borohydride. Okay. So similar as that organic molecules or total synthesis. So it, for the organic molecules, if you already designed like 20 steps to synthesize a particular molecules, so you can add on more steps, right? To further functionalize or further growth these particular molecules. So you can also achieve in metal clusters. So we can use this like small cluster like AU25 as a seed and then to further grow and to uh, large clusters. So for example, you can grow to AU44, so it is the cluster is 44 actons. But the questions you may also ask is, so what exactly happening during this the seed mediated growth, right? So whether the actin will just add on to this small cluster or whether the small cluster, they will aggregate together and fuse together to form the larger metal nano clusters. So we can go further and using these large clusters and then we can further grow and to metal nanocrystals, like gold nanocrystals. Okay? So these are related to the new creations and crystal growth. So this is a one, a very interesting uh, research topics and that ha we have been working on in the past 10 years. All the way from the precursors to a small cluster, 
large cluster, and now it's very challenging. It further grows to a very big uh, nanocrystals. So similar as our organic molecules, so we can also use the small molecules, organic molecules, and then we can add function to these molecules. So for cluster, we can do the same. So we have this cluster, we can add function cluster. That's right. So for example, if, if you want to diversify the properties of this metanol cluster, so one efficient way is to through the ROE, right? So it's really ROE chemistry. So you can add a second metal actance inside your cluster, and then you can diversify the properties of cluster, particularly for, for example, for the catalytic applications. But the questions we may ask is, is always this reaction processes. So the ROE processes. So for example, if you have metal actance like silver cluster or gold, so you have a second metal actance coming. So whether this will replace here, or here or in the center. Okay? So we would like to understand what's the direction dynamics here and this can relate it to the alloy chemistry or precise alloy chemistry. So similarly for a cluster, so besides the metals, the ligands on the surface are also very important. So especially for example, uh, for the biomedical applications. So sometimes we need to design the ligands on the cluster surfaces or we need to add the functions for, from our ligands on the cluster surfaces. For example, you can target the cancer cells. Okay? So this can be done through a ligand exchange. So we can add the two type of ligands on the cluster surfaces. But the questions we may also ask is, so what will be these processes? Okay? So can we achieve, if you have two type of ligands on the cluster surfaces, can we achieve the the, the defined number of a particular the ligand right, or composition right, or their position as well. Okay? So what are exactly are the processes here? Okay? So this is related to the surface engineering. So if you have, can say have some fundamental understanding, it may contribute to the surface engineering. So similar as organic molecules. So we can also use the organ, we can use the molecules as a unit and then to build a large scale materials like doing the crystallization or self assembly. So, cluster, we can also do the self assembly. Right? So, we can self assemble cluster and then to form the super crystals. So, a lot of our my seniors and pioneers in a nano cluster view, so like doing the self assembly to form a single crystals and to solve the structure of these nano clusters. But for me, my research interest is for a water soluble cluster. So we are trying to understand. So these several assembly processes. So if we can have some basic understanding and that may also contribute to the metal materials. So these are the summary for the work we have been doing in the past about 10 years. And from the beginning, we have this a very basic concept. So we are trying to understand the reaction chemistry and towards the formation of metanol cluster. And now we think we are trying to achieve some of the precise ROE chemistry or even for the precise legal engineering chemistry. Okay, so as I mentioned, all the credits are from my PhD students. So they're full of like curiosities here. So today I will, in the rest of the time, I will just share the several examples and related to the total synthesis of methanol clusters. So we will focus our discussion on this like AU25, SR18 nano clusters. And we, as mentioned, we can design some alloy chemistry or ligand exchange or self assembly, and then to convert this cluster to another functional molecules. Right? So this is related to the derivatization chemistry of these particular precursors. So again, derivatization chemistry is very common uh, uh, in the organic chemistry. We got the inspiration from organic chemistry again. So we are trying to do like design science experiments and simply based on like one precursor, like a cluster, like AU25, SR18 cluster, and we design some of the derivatization chemistry and then to convert these particular precursors 
to another functional materials or clusters. For example, so we can do the isomerization. So we have these two clusters. So they have the same molecular formula, but they have a different structure. So they form a different isomers, right? Or we can do this ligand addition chemistry. So these two clusters, they have the same goal number, identified, but one with 18 tile ligands, so another one with 19 tile ligands. So it's more like a ligand addition. We can do a several assembly, but this you need the clusters, or we can do the alloy, right? So we can like this is silver or gold, and then we can alloy with gold or silver. Okay. So we also trying to understand for this cluster. So definitely they're like not very stable in a not super stable in a solutions. So what there are some reaction conditions that may affect the stability of this cluster. And one is the redox reaction, for example, oxidation reaction, right? Or etching reaction. So that may affect the stability of these clusters. So we are we are trying to understand. So what affects their stability? So what are the etching processes of this cluster? And if you incubate them in solutions. So these are several derivatization chemistry we have developed in the past several years. So today I will just show, show you some of these examples. <laughs> so the first one is for the ROE reactions. So this is for the silver nanoclusters. So you have like 25 silver actons, silver 25. So we are trying to understand if there are one gold actons coming in to replace the silver actons. So what will be the reaction processes? For this alloy, right? So we use the real time, the max spectrometry together with the tender mass and with the UV based absorption spectrometry. So we combine them together and then we find out for this cluster the replacement. So the goal will first replace the silver on the surface, on the motif. And after that, we'll go to the second level. And after that, finally, they will go to the center of this. AU24, AU25 nano, AG25 nano clusters. So it's more like we, we can say the uh, silver 25 and talk to go, right? So my heart belongs to you, right? So the silver, the cluster, the heart belongs to uh, one single go atoms. Okay. So this is the first derivatization chemistry. So I'm not discussing the details, the technical part, just show you some of the stories here. So the second one is this isomerization reactions. So this is a collaboration with Professor Hanu, and we are developing, yeah, it's a very interesting funding here. So we have this like red gold nanocluster, like AU25, a very common one. So uh, one day my postdoc, uh, Dr. Chao Yitao, so you find out if you adding some of the CTAB, the surfactant here, so this is the red the gold 25, they can change their color to another cluster. So initially we don't know this is isomer. So finally we, we find out this is isomer for AU25, the red gold clusters. So we have this cluster protected by PMBA on the surface. And we find out if we're adding a CTAB, so CTAB can go into your legal surfaces and interact with like benzene ring on this uh, gold nanoclusters or PMBA. And this can rigidify the surface of this gold nanocluster. If you register the surface on this nanocluster, you need to release this the pressure, right? And then the cluster will start to change to the green AU25, the clusters, okay? And this process is reversible. So if for this green AU25 nanocluster, if we remove this CTA, CTAB from our cluster surface, and then it can relax, right? Our cluster, the surface. And this green AU25 will go back to the red AU25. And we can recycle, do many cycles for this reversible isomerizations. And this is a first order reaction we have identified. So our process is very simple. So AU25 in, in water, if you're adding the CTA to rectify the surface and then after cer certain time of incubation, it will form this 
the green AU25 nanocluster. And if you remove the CTA from the surface of this green gold nanocluster, it will go back to the red AU25 nanocluster's. And the process is a first order reactions. So we can use the UVBs to directly monitor the optical change from this red AU25 to the green AU25. So we can also ident we have also identified the activation energy of this particular reaction for isomerization. <clears throat> So the number three, the derivation of chemistry three, I would like to share is this, the etching reactions. And this is a very long series, the story. So actually I'm, I'm working on the biomedical applications. So it's every time if you use a particular cluster, like AU25 is almost a very stable clusters. But this, even for this AU25, clusters. So they are not super stable, and especially in the presence of like some biomolecules. Okay? So we, we would like to know what happens for this AU25 SR18 nanoclusters, especially in the presence of the tiny ligands. And our common sense is, so you have this cluster, so we have excess tiny ligands. So these tiny ligands, they can etch our cluster. So it's like a top-down processes, right? So the size of this AU25 may become smaller and smaller. So that is our expectations. But we found out it's totally different. So we identify another reaction pathway or this the etching of AU25 SR18 nanoclusters or these etching reactions. So we use the real-time the ESMS spectrometry and then to identify the incubation of this cluster and for about 30 days. So we have obtained the optical, uh, the, the ES, the, the max spectrometry. And after that, we can identify the intermediates towards the etching of this AU25 from very neat, the pure AU25 and to a very maxi, a lot of complexes and also the cluster intermediates. So we have identified like six free electron cluster four free electron cluster two and zero free electron. These are the complexes. So we can also have the time evolution abundance of these intermediates. So for example, this one is our A free electron cluster and then the red are six free electron and this is four and this is two and this is two and this is uh, our complexes. So with these information and then we can try to understand the reaction processes involved in these etchings. So it's very interesting. So we analyze the data and we find out that indeed there are decomposition processes. AU25 SR18 are cluster with A free electrons. So in the presence of oxygen and also tidal ligand, so that etching happen. So I then this will be going smaller and smaller from A free electron to six free electron cluster, and then to like AU20, SR15, and then to four free electron cluster, like very common AU18, SR14, and then to two free electron. And finally, you can go to the complexes. So this is uh, expected uh, processes. But interestingly, besides this, the decompositions, we also find out they are size up processes. So this we call a recombinations. So during some reaction, uh, some certain of the time that like you have a six, four free electron cluster like AU18. So when you form this species, so we start to see some of the bigger cluster also form. Okay, so this is from uh, isoelectric additions and they have the same free electron. So there are no redox reactions involved. So it's just the adding of the complexes in the solutions. So these are a very interesting uh, processes if you can use the ESMS to monitor the whole spectrum of the decomposition of these metanol clusters. So the last example I would like to share is this we call a ligand addition or removal reactions. So again, we go from this AU25 
SR18 nano clusters. So this has the free, A3 electrons. So in the presence of oxygen, so even this oxygen can oxidize this class to form seven free electrons or further oxidize to form these six free electron clusters and with a uh, one positive charge on the clusters. So if there are presence of these tidal ligands, and it's interesting, these tidal ligands, they can add on this positive charge AU25 SR18 cluster, and then to form AU25 SR19 clusters. And this cluster has six free electrons. And this process, the oxidation to six free electrons, the addition of one tidal ligands is a reversible process. So if we pump in the CO, our reducing agent, in this AU25 SR19, and this six free electron cluster can convert back to A3 electron clusters. And we can do many cycles for this ligand addition reactions even in like the oxidation uh, conditions or in a reduction condition, we can remove one ligands. Okay. So our process is very neat. So we have our precursor, for example, AU25 SR18 nanoclusters. So it's in the presence of the oxygens. So we are at another tidal ligands. So they show the different absorption. Okay. So we can also test by the ESMS. So it's a very pure product for this, for convert from this AU25 SR18 to this AU25 SR19. So this process is reversible. So you can see from this AU25 SR18, SR so it's over the reactions, incubations, so it's for about three days. So I fully convert to this AU25 SR19. So this is in the presence of air, right? After 24 hours. But if you change to reductive environments, like we pump in the CO reducing agents. So this AU25 SR19 will convert back to this AU25 SR18. So we can do many cycles on this. So for this ligand addition or ligand removal. So it's a very interesting process. Okay. I just want to summarize. So what I have discussed today is for this derivatization chemistry or a particular precursor like AU25 SR18 is a precursor. So we can design some of the like isomerization processes, ligand additions, ROE or redox like reaction, redox including you, know, you can be in like oxidation environments or reductive environments and also the cell assembly. And then you can convert one cluster and to another product. Okay. With this, I would like to send my group members. So I just mentioned, so all this have been done by my PhD students and postdocs. So, and also my collaborators and P P Professor Hanu and Professor Deng Jiang and Professor Peng Zhang. So they have helped me a lot on this cluster chemistry. And of course my funding uh, support from uh, Singapore. And this is the most important slides. So after the COVID is eased, so welcome to visit Singapore. And that would be very great to take your questions. Thank you. There's a, a, a question to me about it. As, as, uh, as usual, it was a great talk. Um, Thank you. And, and uh, finished well in time. We started a few minutes late. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Uh, for obviously, I can't take all that time. So I'll first start with one question. And then for my colleagues, please unmute yourself and uh, ask your questions. The moment you say uh, total synthesis, obviously, uh, you get uh, the picture of Oler uh, from of urea synthesis in 1828. Yeah. Uh, and to all those uh, giant pioneers in synthesis, Woodward and uh, many others. Uh, synthesis, of course, molecules have become very, very complex as in one slide that you have shown what it means. 
Hmm. Obviously, what one is saying is that synthesis, total synthesis involves mechanisms. Yes, yes. Uh, mechanisms uh, of, of categorized in organic synthesis, you can say addition, elimination, substitution, categorization. Yes. And all of these are, of course, assisted by thermodynamics, kinetics, and many others. Hmm. So to what extent do we know about the mechanism of hmm. one elementary step, let's say a, a crucial elementary step, uh, how do you think we can extend that mechanism mm -hmm. to and, and, and connect it to analogous organic, inorganic mechanisms? Uh, what's your thought on that? I, I would just stop with that question. Let's uh, thank Professor Pradeep. So uh, actually this is a very challenging question as well. So if we want to identify similar as organic molecules, organic synthesis, identify elementary reaction right, towards the formation of like intermediates or the products. So actually we can do some of like uh, the model reactions. So for, for us, we have done like, for example, you have like AUs 23 and if you adding like some complexes, if you have very pure complexes, so we may start to understand. So how these complexes that like, add on this like AU23 or AU25. So that may give us some information of this like the direct step or elementary reactions. But I, I can understand now is extremely challenging cause for this inorganic chemistry is so com complicated as compared to the organic chemistry. So I, I see if you want to have a better understanding for all these elementary reactions and we may have some model reaction systems and that can have, for example, similar as our organic molecules. So we have our precursors and we add just adding another reactants. So these two reactants, they can directly add, right? And then to form our final products. And let, let me give us some useful information for the elementary reactions and towards the products. And, 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 and at least the total synthesis, I should say, is still very far, far away from the total synthesis in organic chemistry. We need to use a core for this synthesis. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. Um, thank one you. of the thoughts oh. that I may have here is that if we identify one, one step, Mm -hmm. One may be in a position to stop that step. Mm -hmm. One may be in a position to accelerate that step. Mm -hmm. uh, just as organic chemists do, like a like mm -hmm. a, some step to stop it yeah. uh, uh, by a by a reagent, uh, mm -hmm. etc. Well, this can take more time to discuss. So I I will leave this here. But that is probably a mm -hmm. direction uh, to look at. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good direction. Yeah, it's a very good thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Colleagues, yeah. I see Thomas is, has raised a question, a uh, hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would also like to thank you for a very nice talk. And I have a question about one particular cluster. You uh, gave comments on one of the silver clusters, which you mixed with gold. And I think it was uh, with the alloying reaction. Yes. So when you sort of position or when you replace one of the silver atoms in that cluster for a gold atom. So I have a, like a few questions uh, linked to that. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is the slide. So could you comment on the energy difference between these clusters when the gold atom is on the surface and when it's inside? And uh, what, is, what is the energy difference and whether you could sort of also turn it backwards by, I don't know, maybe heating the, the final product, which I suppose is more stable. And what does, what do these experiments tell us about the dynamic character of the metal core? Because I thought 
even when you have purely silver cluster, there is some sort of dynamicity, dynamic character, where maybe one silver atom can swap position with another one. And this gold atom is like a labeled atom. It has the same size as silver and it allows you to sort of track uh, the atom. So to what, what, does it, what does it say about the, the dynamic character of the metal clusters themselves? Okay, thank you, Thomas, it's a fantastic questions. So let me answer the first one. So actually, if you, it's an energy difference of the clusters on, on the surface and in the second level and in, a, in, in, in the center. So you do the simulations. So you find out if in the center, this is thermodynamic driven process. So this is the most stable cluster uh, if the cluster or I'm, I'm not sure if we can reverse the process. So, and using like, for example, you, you, you suggest if you heat it up this very stable cluster, whether it can go back to, I mean, diffuse out, right? From, from the, uh, the center, I mean, to like, the surface. And what I'm thinking is the one possible way is, so you may use the ligand, maybe they have an interaction and then they, 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 they may diffuse back. But if you it's the pure ligand system, so if they go inside the center, they will just stay there. It's like my, my heartbeat yeah. belongs to you, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. So for the dynamics factors, I, I'm not very sure, I mean, for the, for the goal and for a lot of the studies, if uh, only have one like goal top in like silver cluster, so you always go to the center of the cluster. For, for, for many studies, you using this replacement reactions or you can use the curl reduction reaction. So they always occupy the center. So I think mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that is because the thermodynamic driven. So mm -hmm. the, the, the gold and silver is very, very, uh, they have a very similar properties. So I think the, the goal may be stay inside and, and that can reduce the, the energy of this cluster. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, was, I was wondering uh, if the, the energy difference wouldn't be that, that big, that maybe uh, there would be a distribution of these clusters. But thank you for, for, for your answer. I think you clarified it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I see Rob Wetton has asked a question in the chat box, if you can respond to that. Yeah. Do you want... Thank you, Paul Wetton. So, Paul Wetton is asking, I'm curious with technical, curious technical details of your real-time ESI math, whether there is a clean up step or other procedures between reactor and reactions and electro spray. So for the clusters, we, 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 we are measuring if we are doing a real time. So we directly, like every two minutes, we directly pump the solution inside, uh, in, inside and then to mo monitor the, the max spectral. In, there, is, there is no cleanup step. That is so we do not clean the, even for the samples, we do not uh, purify our, 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 our samples. Great. Thank you. For the, thank you. Other, thank you, Paul Vettel. But for yeah. some other the clusters, like we, we, for the final products, normally you need to purify the samples. Mm. Right. Could I ask another real quick question? Um, 2519, you've identified this, um, this addition reaction, 25 comma 19, and you have a structure or a structure model uh, for that. And uh, I wondered about that uh, structure. And, it, and is this quick uh, question, is that classified as one electron oxidation or is it a two electron oxidation? Um, what's the charge, in other words, on the... Uh, so the, if, if you know. Yeah, this is very great questions. So we, we, we don't know the structures of this cluster. So this cluster is protected by MHA, so it's in, in water. 
So it's very difficult to do the crystallization and then to have the structure of this uh, AU25 SR19 cluster. So we don't know the structure. So for the, it, for the like, oxidations, so we observe like in our systems, so we have like a free electron cluster. And if you, you just incubate in, in, in the air, and yes. it will start to be oxidized to form seven free electron and to six free electron. Mm -hmm. So when you start to form the six free electrons, so it will be take up the one Tyler ligands in a solution, okay. and then mm -hmm. it will, it will add the uh, solution. So this, no, that's all clear. I'm sorry I missed that. But you did have a structure model on your summary uh, slide, um, which had a very open uh, ring on one side on your summary yeah. slide of the derivatization chemistry. Yeah, it's it's oh, very small there, but I, I'm... It's from the equation. Yeah. Simulation. Yeah. Do you see the structure there to the yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Middle, center right, yeah. Okay. So it, it, it's from EFT calculation from the Zhang the, the, the Oh, number. from Riverside, from the... Yeah, yeah. Day and okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Interesting, very, very fascinating. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, colleagues, are there other questions? Uh, uh, Maiti, Subarna? Yes, sir. Very nice and in enlightening talk, Professor Zai. Learned a lot about total synthesis of nanocluster. I just have a simple query that uh, I think the real time mass analysis depends on the resolution of the at least duration between the two mass analysis and if the conversion between the intermediates because they are very unstable in the solution so if that becomes faster than the analysis so how do we address the problem so let, 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 that's a very good question so the durations during the formations and it's very important because some of the cluster intermediates are very active. So for the reduction processes, like during the formation, like 25, like AU25 nanocluster, so the duration for our, to taking a samples is about two minutes for us to, for the ESMS me measurement. Uh, but for the like etching processes, actually it's very slow. So it's, sometimes you need uh, like one hour or two hours and one day, two days. So the duration is different. It depends on the reaction kinetics that involve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, colleagues, um, are there other questions? We are at uh, 7.38 uh, in Indian time. Course. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I don't see other questions. It's a um, great pleasure to see all of you. We had cloth, well, we had about uh, 80 participants or so, uh, and all of them stayed back. And we are now at 65. Very nice, and um, I think it is um, creating a lot of enthusiasm. And several students from various research groups have joined. That is uh, that's very nice. Rajneesh, you have something to ask? Uh, well, oh okay. no, I just wanted to say hi to Jinping. Nice seeing him hi. actually. Hi, nice seeing you. Yeah, look forward to meet you, Jinping. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to busy. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, and let us. Um, uh, th there are several insights, and uh, and, and many of uh, you would like to pursue uh, some of these insights, and that will be that will indeed be great. Uh, and there are several several open questions wherein great many collaborations are required, uh, and and that is also an open thing uh, for for all of us. Uh, Rob, you are uh, very nice to see you too. Um, yeah, now you are in the office or at home? Yeah, I'm in the office. And the sun, another brilliant day here in the, the mountains. So my best to you all. Thank you, Pradeep, for hosting these wonderful series. Well, let me, let me clarify one thing about the San Diego, the ACS meeting in San Diego. The, the participants seem to be overjoyed to be meeting in person again. 
um, regardless whether they were wearing masks or not. So I, I wanted to be clear that they weren't celebrating the end of the of the face covering, but only the uh, the chance to uh, have these very informal encounters. Thank you. So thank yeah. you for for re mentioning that mm -hmm. last weekend. Mm -hmm. Bye. Very nice. Uh, thank you, Tatsuya, for joining, and thank you all of you. And uh, we will next uh, meeting. We will have who? Who is presenting? Rob Wetton is giving a talk. Yeah, I, I believe so. Five weeks from today. And, uh, oh, great! Great. Then it will be it will be great to um, see you and um, listen to something you. Something special. Something special for you all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you all of you for, for joining. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a Good nice day. weekend. Yeah. Bye, Pravin. Bye. Nice seeing you, you also. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Jinping Xu. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thomas. Bye. Bye. Thomas. Bye.